plant again. Most welcome. You hear me? Doctor? You hear me, Professor? Yes. And hello again, Pro hello. Professor Kayahan. Hello. Anybody hear me? I do hear you, yes. Uh, I cannot hear your voice. Hello. Hello again. Thank you Hi. to join us again. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, now it's half past uh, 12 and our webinar is started. Just now we have 46 participants. And if you let me and Professor Kayahan let me, can we start our program? Professor yes. Kayahan? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to two days joint online program between Tehran University of Medical Sciences Dental School and Dental Faculty of Yeditepe University in Istanbul, Turkey, with the title of uh, advanced, Advancement in Treatment Approach uh, with Focusing on Emergency Cases. This program includes four panels, uh, Restorative Prosthodontic Dentistry, and or maxillofacial surgery and periodontics, which will be held in day one. In, on day two, uh, the panels include pediatric dentistry and orthodontics and endodontics. I would like to appreciate the Dean of the Dental School of uh, Yeditepe University, uh, Professor Kuro, if I spell it properly, and uh, Professor Rocht, the Dean of the School of Tehran University of Medical Sciences, helping us in organizing this program. I'm sure very useful and practical information we will deliver to you in a clear manner. And I fully expect that and the, this seminar will influence your daily practice. The information that we will release to you in these two days uh, webinar program provide you with enough information with the opportunity uh, to choose the right treatment approach and plan in emergency cases. As you know, the first panel uh, starts with the prosto restorative dentistry. In each panel, we have four speakers from Iran and Turkey. I would like to introduce uh, Professor Kayahan, um, uh, the professor from Yeditepe uh, University and Prosto Restorative Department, uh, which is moderator of this panel. And I would like to appreciate her to accompany me uh, for uh, holding this program. Thank you, Professor Kayahan, accompanying me in this program. The webinar on each day finishes around half past. Um, 5 or 6 p.m. And uh, at the end of each webinar, each speech will be running a live question and answer. And I will ask the participant to write the question in the chat box. And in each and at the end of each panel, each speech, we have around five, 10 minutes to answer the questions. And, and I would like to invite you, all the participants, to attend the competition that will be held at the end of the fourth panel on day two. Um, uh, for, for more details about this competition, please uh, follow the chat box. All the information and details will be released in the chat box. And uh, now the first speakers um, will be from Turkey, uh, Professor, um, uh, Professor, and Jeff Lute, I would like to uh, I would like to ask Professor Kayahan uh, to introduce the uh, uh, speakers and the stage is yours. Please, Professor Kayahan, the stage is yours. Thank you, Dr. Fariba. Good morning, my colleagues, my friends, uh, all participants and all students, and also Dr. Fariba for your nice introduction also. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, welcome you to this international course program and it's also a pleasure for me to be involved in such a scientific program. Uh, you know, as you mentioned before, uh, the first uh, session is, uh, will be about the prosthodontics and restorative dentistry. And uh, we will have two speakers. Our first speaker of this session, uh, Dr. Javan Jampolat, is assistant professor in Yettepe University, Faculty of Dentistry, uh, Department of Prosthodontics. And the topic is prosthodontic emergencies in COVID-19 days. Uh, 
Uh, and if the participants have any questions or contributions, they can write on the chat box during the lecture. And after the lecture is completed, uh, I will read and I will kindly ask to, uh, your questions to our variable speakers. And uh, Dr. Jan Polat, please. Hello, good morning to Turkey and good afternoon to Iran. I am now trying to share my screen. My name is Jaehun Jampolat. I have been working at the Yeditepe University School of Dentistry since 2000. And today we will be talking about prosthetic emergencies. But with the COVID-19 pandemic have been with us for more than one and a half year, I will, I will just remind you some precautions that we should take as we practice our, uh, in our daily, daily practice. We all have to know about the symptoms of coronavirus and I'm sure we are all, we all know about too much about this, these symptoms. People with systemic diseases should be even more careful about this COVID-19 pandemic. Economic, occupational, and financial worries have led us dentists to get worried about our future. And fortunately, we have, we have been vaccinated and we hope the vaccinations that we have had will work properly and we will pass through this pandemic healthily. The pre-treatment precautions that we have taken of, since the start of the pandemic, I will show you some slides from our faculty. As dentists, we have been trained about the viruses, but we were mostly trained, we were more careful about the viruses that were bloodborne. But this pandemic, with this COVID-19 pandemic, spreads out very fastly because it's airborne. So we had to take some more precautions like barriers on the elevators and the social distancing and the appointment, the waiting rooms, uh, they, it should not be very crowded. The patients should be asked to come on time uh, so that the waiting rooms are not, that don't get very crowded. In the waiting rooms, the people should be seated apart from each other. And the newspapers and magazines have been removed already. We don't, the first thing that we have to care is first do not harm as Hippocrates stated. In this meaning, we have to help to stop the spread of germs. And we all know what, what we should do, the social distancing and wearing masks and washing hands. We are all familiar, familiar with these. Here are some changes that we have made in our students clinic. We have separated the boxes from each other with these uh, shields. And the precautions have been reminded to us. We have already known the precautions that we should take, but they were reminded with these signs, like when and how to wash hands, and hand hygiene and personal protective equipment, washing hands, sharp box, medical trash, and the droplet isolation, what we should do. And we also spray the clinics with sodium hypochlorous for five seconds and then wait for five minutes. We cover all touching areas with barriers. And sterilization. You see, we have been uh, we have been carrying out sterilization all the way, but since this with this with this airborne COVID nineteen virus, 
we have to be even more careful. This is a picture from the pre-pandemic times. And you see how many things we have done wrong. Now we are very careful and we dress like this as we treat patients. We also had to include a question of uh, travel history of the patient in our, in our dental anamnesis. Well, if we talk about the urgencies or emergencies in prostodontics, the word emergency may not be applicable to prostodontic treatment in the true medical sense. There are many situations in which a prostodontic attention is required urgently. This urgent care is needed so that the patient can carry on with his usual activities without impairment in oral function or appearance. Here are a few precautions that we should take during the pandemic, like using of disposable instruments or sterilized instruments, postpone invasive dental treatment uh, to stop generating aerosols, use of extraoral radiographs rather than intraoral ones, use of mouthwash before treatment, and use of rubber dam where applicable. The emergencies, the prostodontic, we, we can classify the prostodontic emergencies in this manner, in this, in this classification. A fractured prosthetics, it should be repaired urgently. So you can repair it in your clinic or you can send it to the laboratory. And there are some cases where you have to do something more than repairing a denture. Like in these two cases, the patients will lose all upper teeth and they have these partial dentures and with the pandemic, uh, we don't want old people to come into the clinic very frequently to make new dentures and they don't want to stay without teeth until the healing, the wound healing is completed. So in these two cases, I changed the partial dentures into complete dentures, chair side, right in the clinic, as you will see. I just covered the, the, the flange areas with pink wax, layers of pink wax, made impressions with the, the pink, wax, pink wax layers helped me uh, have enough space for the base plate. After the impressions have been completed, in one case, I just cut the roots of the original teeth, the natural teeth, and placed them in the impression. In the other case, I just used a temporary, uh, temporary material to make the to to, to have the uh, artificial teeth. Then, with the help of self-curing acrylic, I placed the impressions back into the mouth. And came up with a denture like this. In this case, this is the, these are the natural teeth. Then after trimming the denture, I used a temporary light relining material to place the denture in place. And this is how it looked. These are the natural teeth and these are the temporary uh, artificial tooth with complete dentures. And here it is how it looks. A fractured, in, in terms of fractured prosthetics, then we go back to, we, we go up to the fixed ones. We may have the veneering material fractured. We can repair this with repairing kits or we have to remove the fixed denture and send it to the laboratory. 
as we send it to the laboratory, we have to take some precautions, like after the impression or the material that we tried has been tested, we rinse them thoroughly, we spray them with disinfectant and wait for five minutes, then rinse again, put them in a plastic bag, make sure that you don't touch the plastic bag with, uh, with the gloves the out, in the outer side. You have, to, you, you have to take the glove off and replace the, replace the instruction sheet into the pocket. Once it, once it gets to the laboratory, it will be rinsed truly and they will keep working on. After the work has been finished at the laboratory, they will rinse it, they will spray it, put it in the plastic bag. Again, don't touch the outer side of the plastic bag with gloves. And in the clinic, we remove it, spray it, rinse it, and carry on with our treatment. If we want to remove the crowns, in emergency cases, sometimes it we get hard, time, hard times to remove the crowns. Then we have to cut the crowns to reach to the natural tooth. In pandemic days, it might be a good idea to access the cavity created through the crown. We don't have to remove the crown so that we don't create so much aerosol. This is another emergency case where a, a tooth should be extracted and the patient doesn't want to leave the office, the clinic without, without his teeth, his tooth. What we did was to cut the crown uh, and adhere it to the neighboring teeth as a, as a temporary crown and the patient was happy. Another case with two central incisors to be extracted. In this case, we made an imp impression before we extracted the teeth and sent it to the laboratory. The, lab the technician removed the teeth to be extracted and prepared a two temporary crowns from artificial teeth. And with the help of adhesion, we placed them in place and the patient was so happy after extraction. Another method that I, I employ frequently is the use of the small partial denture that you make an impression before the extraction, you send it to the laboratory, the technician removes the tooth to be extracted and with the help of small clasps, he makes a small partial denture. I strongly advise my patients to remove this appliance or denture when they are eating and when they are sleeping. But I mostly use this appliance in young ladies and I know that they don't remove it as they, they have lunch at school or, or at work. They eat with it. And this is how it looks in mouth. The cemented crown inlay and onlays should be seated, should be cemented right away. This is another emergency that we face frequently. In terms of implant supported prostodontics, the patient may come up with a fractured uh, framework. Then in days of COVID-19, we can kindly smoothen the sharp edges and we may ask the patient to keep wearing the appliance, the, the, the denture again. We don't have, we, it depends on the seriousness of the pandemic, whether to repair it or not. In case of loose crown screws, then we have to tighten them. Sometimes the patient who is waiting for the wound healing with the a temporary abutment may lose the temporary abutment, then we have to make a small surgery and place the uh, temporary abutment again. 
And what happened, the worst thing that could happen about implant supported prostodontics is the fracture of the screw. It happens a lot. I mostly use a, an explorer, a scaler, an angle drive, and some different kinds of screwdrivers that I got from a store. I put them into the through the sterilization before I use, and a few times I managed to remove the uh, fractured screw with a masaran with the with the help of the masaran kit from the endodontics department. What I do first is to try to turn this the fractured screw counterclockwise, and in most cases they will just come up with it. If they don't, I go with the scaler or with the angle drive, uh, turning counterclockwise with a round burr, with, with, with a round carpet burr on it. Here are the removed, the, the broken fractured uh, screws and the removed parts. Sometimes uh, the attachment, the female part of the attachment that has been attached to the uh, denture may come off. And this is something that you should carry out in the clinic. You don't, you, you just, if you want to send it to the laboratory, you have to go through all the impression stages and stuff. It is wise to fix it into the denture right in the clinic. But you have to be very careful. You will fix it with the help of cold curing acrylic. And you have to be very careful that the cold curing acrylic doesn't flow into the undercuts. So you have to cover the undercuts. You have to fill the undercuts with the help of the, something like a wax. This is a utility wax from the orthodontics department. You have to cover the undercuts. Then you place the cold curing acrylic in the denture, you place it in the mouth, make sure that you keep the patient in centrifugation until the cold curing acrylic gets uh, monomerized. A fractured tooth may be treated with the help of fiber a post. Hopefully we have this fiber post. It's easy. You just open the cavity with its own uh, burr and then place it and adhere it to the tooth. But I just want to, you see, I don't like to use the fiber post in other teeth than the central incisors and laterals. I know many people, many friends that they use fiber posts in canines, premolars and molars. I just don't like to use them. In case of a canine premolar or molar, I like to use a cast post. And the denture cause problems can be overcome easily right in the clinic without too many sessions. Like in one session, you can remove the, uh, you, you can just overcome the problem. And the adaptation of a dent of denture before radiotherapy. This is not, this has nothing to do with COVID-19 pandemic. You have to do your best because this is emergency. A patient in need of a radiotherapy is always an emergency. So you have to take all precautions because probably he has, the patient has been gone under chemotherapy and something. So you have to be very, very, very careful and you have to carry on the work. And you have to wash your hands. I know you the sanitizer, hand sanitizers work very well. You have to either use hand sanitizers or wash your hands regularly. And I strongly ask you and recommend you to have your stuff in the clinic, the nurses, the secretary, the technician, everyone to, to watch this video 
that is titled if saliva were read from organization for safety and asepsis procedures foundation it is amazing so please have your stuff see this video and thank you for your attention mercy behatere tavajo hetun i i'm i will be glad to answer any questions if there is any thank you Thank you for your nice presentation and uh, excellent cases. Uh, they were very successful. Uh, I know you very well. Uh, we, we are working together for many years uh, and I saw dead cases in face to face. Uh, <laughs> I have a question. Uh, is there any special disinfection solution for the impression materials? Well, or or we use any uh, any type yes we have i'm not familiar with the name but we have a different uh, solution for the impression materials and we have another uh, disinfectant solution for the surfaces we use them separately yes they are different yes yes uh, and another question uh, you know, we have lots of treatment sessions in prostodontics. Uh, and how can you manage uh, the long lasting prostodontic treatments in pandemic conditions, especially for the patients with low immunity? How can we decrease the sessions? Well, uh, the first thing is that we have, we, in case of COVID-19 days and with, the, with, this, with, with, with such these patients, we have to, if we, we can postpone the treatment, if we can, if it's not emergency, but if we, if we must carry on the treatment, we have to be very careful. We have to be uh, like, we don't want the patients to see each other. So we postpone with the sessions, like for a 30 minute uh, clinical case, we make an appointment for one hour so that we have enough time to clean the clinic and the spraying and waiting and stuff. And with such distant uh, sessions, the patients don't get to see each other. And for, from the since, of the since the start of the pandemic, the people have been coming to me and saying that, you see, it is surprising to see, not to see so many people around. And I ask them, and I tell them that we have postponed the sessions uh, to clean the clinic so that they don't see each other. Thank you uh, again for your uh, answer, uh, answers. I am checking additional questions, but I couldn't see. Uh, so we can continue with our second speaker uh, of this session. Me. Professor Kayan, I have three questions from okay. Professor Jack, Jack Palat, if you let me to ask my question. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, uh, first of all, I I'm thankful for the nice presentation you had. It was very useful to me. I Thank have you. some question. I would be thankful if you kindly advise me. Uh, my first question, in the first slide you show that, as you just mentioned, the private practice should not be overcrowded, so the patient does not see each other uh, in order to reduce the transfer of the uh, disease to other patients. But what about the dental faculty that each day is many patients referred and uh, many patients are waiting in the waiting room? What What is your what is your um, this what is your suggestion about the controlling the pandemic in dental faculty that the many patients are referred and the waiting room is overcrowded well thank you for the question and let me give you an example from our school mm -hmm. the the first uh, examination that the patients go through is in the uh, oral diagnosis department before mm -hmm. the pandemic, any patient could come in at any time to have an examination. But since the start of the pandemic, 
we started to make appointments for the first examination in the oral diagnosis department. We don't let the patients come in as they want. They must have an appointment. So it doesn't get very crowded and mm -hmm. this works. Mm -hmm. And they, they tolerate this, they or they understand this. The, the mm -hmm. secretaries at the front desk ex explained that this precaution of uh, appointments have been taken to protect the patients from each other. So it works very well. People understand. Okay, so by this way, the approach I have followed in these days, in these two years, is to limit the referred patient refer to dental school by calling them and give them an appointment time. Is yes, it right? Okay. Yes, it is right. That's right. And my second question is that I think it was in the third slide or fourth slide that you showed that you sprayed the sodium hypochlorite in the air. Is it right? I just can't. Well, could you? Oh yeah. The, 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 well, there was a there was something wrong with the connection. Are you to, are you asking me about the spray that we spray the whole clinic? Yeah. Well, what the material you I think uh, I think I heard that you you mentioned the sodium hypochlorite is sprayed in the air. It is, is called it right? sodium hypochlorous. It is called sodium hypochlorous, not chloride. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. So it is used, as we have seen on TVs all around the world, we do the same thing. We spray the clinics with it uh, for like four, five, they say four, five seconds is enough. Then we have to wait for another five minutes before entering the room. And what's, what, in what, what interval, after each patient? Yes, in between, okay. you know, yes. Once the patient leaves the room, the nurse cleans everything, cleans, makes a, a physical cleaning, okay? okay? Everything is clean. Then the, 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 the work, the employee comes in and sprays the room with it. Then we wait for another five minutes. Then, five the, minutes. Nurse, yeah, then the nurse gets in to make the barriers on the touched surfaces. Mm -hmm. And what is the concentration of the material? I you see I don't want I don't know I don't okay, want to I don't want to say matter. something wrong. Yes, and uh, the, may I ask my last question, please? Yes, please. Yeah, thank you. You did a great job and show you in the slide that you changed the removable partial denture to full denture by placing um, re re extracted the two separate the uh, the separated the roots from the crowns and attach it to the removable partial denture to change it to a complete denture. And yes. it is my question that nowadays and during this pandemic condition, is it a safe procedure for the dentist? Because the cutting of the roots and produce the huge amounts of the iris cell that might be, not be dangerous for the clinician. And do you, do you suggest another treatment planning for this um, emergency cases in these days? Well, if you can postpone the treatment, mm -hmm. you should. But mm -hmm. uh, a patient wouldn't like to leave the clinic without teeth in case of such a patient. Like in that uh, case, my pay, you see, I just thought of using natural teeth in the full denture, in the complete denture. And the patient was working for a company, for a chemistry company. And after I told him that I was planning to do such a thing with natural teeth a temporary mm -hmm. complete denture. And he was happy with it. He, uh, he agreed and we did it. We carried on the work. And in two days later, he came up and said that he had to go, he had to travel into Europe and mm -hmm. he didn't know for how long because a competitive company was trying to steal their customers in Austria, in Romania, and uh, in other countries. So he went to Europe. He stayed there more than one and a half month with that denture on, and he yes. was so happy. So the, the patient, if the patient doesn't want to leave the room, if, if, the, if he doesn't want to leave the clinic without teeth, 
There is nothing else to do. And as dentists, uh, you, should, you see, I have been hearing in the news that uh, the occupation, the, 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 the occupation, the, the members of dentistry, we are the list in the list group that have been affected from this pandemic because if, even before the pandemic, we know how to protect ourselves. We know how to protect, how to wear masks. Nowadays, we are wearing two masks on each other. So yeah, well, if this is kind of a must, if we have to carry on our occupation. So I yeah. wouldn't say, I wouldn't try to postpone the treatment or trans transferring a partial denture to a complete denture, I will right, do it right away in the clinic with the help of uh, shield and everything with the PPE, personal protective equipment and everything. Yes, I will do the same thing. Thank you, thank you. And uh, not it is. It was not my last question. It is my last question. Um, the okay. standard precautions always should be followed and should be observed. Uh, in these days and uh, following the pandemic condition, is anything has been added to the standard precaution that you kindly show in your slide, for example, rinsing the impression under the running water and disinfecting the impression material. So all those um, um, infection control procedures that you kindly showed it in your uh, PowerPoint and slide is exactly the standard precaution that we previously followed and observed. Is anything has been anything has been added to this principle yes. or not? Yes, spraying the rooms with sodium hypochlorous has been added to these precautions because the others have you see we all like social distancing. We didn't know much to be honest. We didn't know much about social distancing. So yes, social distancing. Uh, and spraying the clinics with sodium hypochlorous have been added to these the, to the precautions that we have employed earlier. Thank you, appreciate it. Thank you for all the details and your patience to answer uh, to answer my question. Best wishes for all guys and for you, there, Professor. Thank you, thank you, Professor Kayahan, that you, you give me the opportunity to ask my question from uh, Professor Jakupala. Thank you. We have another question from the participants. Uh, I recently went to a dentist and they made patients wear shoe covers before entering and they insisted on it so much. Is it really effective and necessary? Uh, this is a good question. When, in the times when I had my private clinic, I was having patients wear shoe covers Yes, but I believe that, to be honest, I believe that it is to keep the clinics away from mud and rainy, rainy weathers. So I'm not sure about the microorganisms. If the staff is careful enough to take care of the clinic, it's okay if the patients didn't wear shoe covers. Uh, well, I don't know. You see, I'm not a microbiologist or something. But in the times when I had my own clinic, yes, I had my patient, patients wear shoe covers as they entered the clinic. I'm not, I'm not sure if this is the answer, but this is all I can say. Thank you. I think this is the answer. <laughs> I also <laughs> think a similar way with you. Uh, if you don't have any other question, no. So thank you very much again for your presentation and cases and the answers. Uh, now we can continue with the uh, second speaker of this session. Uh, Dr. Burcu Dikici is assistant professor in Yeditepe University Faculty of Dentistry, Department of Restorative Dentistry. And uh, the topic is restorative treatments of traumatic dental injuries. Uh, dear doctor, please. Uh, thank you, Professor Kayan. Uh, good morning, everybody, uh, all professors, uh, my colleagues and participants. 
Uh, it's very pleasure to be involved in this course and present my topic. Thank you very much. Uh, now I am going to share my screen. Uh, my name is Dr. Burcu Dikici. Uh, today my topic is restorative treatment of traumatic dental injuries. I have to. A dental trauma is injury to the mouth, including teeth, lips, gums, tongue, and jawbone. A soft tissue injuries to the mouth and dental trauma are typically very painful and should receive prompt treatment. A one quarter of the population under the age of 18 sustain a traumatic injuries due to the poor accident or automobile accident. Uh, and 96% of these injuries uh, involve maxillary incisors. Uh, a treatment procedure after the trauma affects the prognosis and diagnosis of the teeth in the mouth, and it's very essential and important. Uh, the most common dental trauma is a broken or lost tooth, and some of the tooth uh, are lost in the future or require immediate attention for the restoration, aesthetic, and phonation. Uh, how to manage dental trauma, uh, clinical examination, radiographic examination, and photographic documentation is essential. Uh, we have to evaluate pulp status. Splinting time is important. The use of antibiotics uh, if the infection is acute. And follow-up uh, is the management of traumatic cases. Uh, first, we have to uh, have personal information and medical history of the patient. It is also important. Uh, dental history is our job and very important also. The past history uh, of the dental history of the patient determines the patient's co cooperation. And we have to question after the injury, when, where, and how. Uh, time is critical factor for the uh, for determination of the technique and prognosis of the treatment that we give. Uh, the shorter time between the trauma and treatment, uh, the better prognosis, we all know this. Uh, where place of injury, also very important due to the prophylactic tetanus immunization. And how, how did the injury occur? If it occurs directly, uh, it causes tooth fracture, uh, root fracture. If it occurs indirectly, it may cause subcondylar fracture or temporomandibular joint dislocation. We have to question this question. Uh, clinical examination, uh, such as medical examination, external examination, and intraoral examination, are uh, the assessments that we have to do. Medical examination, such as nasal hemorrhagia, neck pain, we have to check these uh, questions. External examination, as we can see, if there's a fracture in the uh, fascia or there's a fracture in the zygoma, we have to check. We have also to check these uh, questions. Uh, and intraoral examination is, again, our job. Soft tissue and heart tissue examination. A uh, soft tissue examination like laceration of tongue, uh, hematoma or bleeding in the floor, it affects our prognosis. And the heart tissue examination, type of injury, tooth fracture, uh, tooth displacement, avulsion, uh, color change, or uh, the decrease in translucency, we have to check all these problems after the trauma. Uh, radiographic examination, uh, we should do, we should have radiography after the trauma due to the root development, root fracture, periapical radiolucency, tooth fragment, or foreign body in the soft tissue. Uh, as with all treatments, uh, a true medical and dental history 
should be completed. Then extraoral and intraoral assessment uh, should be completed next. Uh, if the emergency is due to trauma, the face or oral cavity can be cleaned uh, with water to visualize the damaged tissue. Uh, then, of course, radiographic examination is essential. Appropriate radiographs should be taken. If possible, tomography can be used, uh, such as used in the uh, serious injuries like uh, alveolar fractures. Uh, adjunctive death diagnostic test also important for uh, the diagnosis and treatment for the traumatic tooth. Uh, vitality test has to be noted that injured tooth may be in a state of shock and they won't respond. They may not respond to vitality testing. So vitality testing may be postponed two weeks later. These diagnostic tests determine the pulpal and periapical diagnosis, uh, which affect the appropriate treatment that we can do. Uh, in vitality tests, we should uh, examine multiple teeth with the quadrant of concern. Uh, we have to test the, uh, all the quadrants of the mouth. Testing teeth outside the area of the trauma uh, is a baseline and provide the patient's normal response, can be a normal response, to any given stimulus. And it is important to uh, test the furthest away the teeth of the pain first, because uh, patients will be more relaxed and uh, more relaxed and uh, less likely to provide the inaccurate results for the vitality test. Percussion is also important. Sensitivity to slight tapping. Uh, may relate to the periodontium issue, injury, uh, possible periodontal pathology, root fracture, or displacement, root displacement. We have to take, of course, periodontal radiography. Excuse me, Burju, uh, can you please uh, talk louder? Okay, of course. The participants uh, wrote on the chat box. Okay, I can see the chat box, and uh, I'm trying to speak louder thank you uh, the aim of the treatment uh, of dental injuries is maintain the pulp uh, vitality uh, and restore normal aesthetic function uh, contour and occlusion this is the aim of our uh, treatment uh, dental injuries can be classified as luxation injuries and fracture injuries uh, I'm going to tell all the injuries now. Uh, first, dental fractures, forces that are applied to the tooth that can lead to fractures. Uh, the classification is important because it guides the management. Uh, class one fracture involves the enamel, class two fracture involves the enamel and dentin, and class three fractures involves enamel, dentin, and the pulp tissue. Uh, enamel fracture, or we can say chip, uh, chipping, is a complete fracture of enamel without the involvement of dentin and pulp. Uh, a fracture occurs uh, when a tooth contacts a hard object uh, with enough force to break a section of enamel. A pulp sensibility test is recommended for all the traumatic injuries because it's important uh, to uh, assess the pulp vitality. A treatment depends uh, on the size of the uh, fracture size. Uh, if, the, if we can do just contouring the enamel or we can restore the uh, diastema. This is my case. Uh, he broke his enamel and I restore all the anterior region for aesthetic reason. Uh, the follow-up is also essential. Six to eight weeks for clinical follow-up is recommended uh, for the enamel fracture. Uh, enamel and dentin fracture 
uh, is a complex structure of the tooth enamel and dentin. Uh, without exposure of the pulp, uh, sometimes pulp can expo uh, exposure, we can see it. A pulp sensibility test also is recommended to confirm pulp health. A treatment depends on how to close the fracture is in relationship with the pulp. We can do provisional treatment in, in a dentin in an enamel uh, fracture. Uh, or we can do a composite restoration for the uh, traumatized teeth. If the exposed dentin is within uh, 0 0.5 millimeter of the pulp, uh, we can use uh, capping material. We have to follow up six to eight weeks for clinical uh, assessment. Uh, enamel dentin and pulp fracture, uh, a fracture involving enamel and dentin uh, with exposure of the pulp. The mobility is generally normal. Uh, for young patients with immature, still developing teeth, it is advantageous to preserve pulp stability with pulp capping or partial pulpotomy. We can use calcium hydroxide or MTA material for, for capping. Uh, in patients with mature epical, development, root canal treatment is generally recommended, but we have to try pulp capping or partial pulpotomy uh, first, but in the follow-up weeks, we can uh, change our uh, treatment, but if uh, the for the clean teeth, without the carrier teeth, we have to try the capping material uh, first. Uh, root fractures uh, are rare fractures for among all dental injuries. They are very rare. They are defined as a uh, fracture involved dentin, cement, and pulp because it occurs in the root. A horizontal root fracture most common, commonly occur in the middle third of the root and very rarely in the apical root. Maxillary central incisors are most prone to uh traumatic injuries due to their uh, position in the mouth we have to uh, examine the proper clinical and radiographic examination uh, for correct treatment for correct diagnosis uh, in apical root fracture we don't need there is no need the treatment is required uh, up by x-rays up to six months and put tooth out of occlusion firstly. We have to instruct patient not to overload the tooth. One month later, uh, union may occur by plastic or fibrous tissue, but if the fracture line increases in width, uh, it is essential to uh, do root canal treatment uh, followed by surgical removal of apical fragments. Uh, clinician must check the mobility of, and of the coronal fragments and the pulp stability. It is also essential. Uh, two or three radiographs from different angulations should be taken for the management of the fracture location. Uh, it is also very important. Uh, this case. Uh, is our case with Professor Tanat. Uh, one year follow up of two maxillary central incisors with horizontal root fractures at, at the apical third. Uh, after the patient referred to our clinic, uh, we uh, applied fiber splint for all anterior incisors. And one month later, uh, we have to do root canal treatment for the two teeth. Uh, but after six months, a calcific tissue formation was observed uh, in the fracture line. During the one year follow up, uh, the picture is the one year follow up and the radiography. The teeth show no mobility and uh, excellent soft tissue healing. The oral hygiene is also important for the 
their prognosis of the restoration. Uh, middle root fractures, uh, root part attached to the crown, crown isn't enough to stabilize the tooth, so we have to supplant these teeth. In general, for all the uh, uh, root fractures, we generally supplant the teeth for mobilizing the teeth. Teeth with fractures should be supplanted for six to uh, four to six weeks. Uh, why are these supplants? To promote healing of periodontal ligament, neurovascular supply, and alveolar supporting. Uh, cervical third root fracture. Uh, it is a very dangerous fracture, I think. If the fracture is at bone level, uh, we remove the coronal fragment. Uh, following this, the root canal treatment is done, and we can do restoration with crown or uh, fiber post with crown. Uh, if the fracture is one to two millimeter infrabony, uh, we have to do osteoplasty to uh, do treatment. Then we have to do root canal treatment or uh, we extrude the teeth by orthodontic treatment. If the fracture is too far infrabony, we have to extract the teeth. For longitudinal fractures, uh, it is the teeth is generally extract. A requirement of successful treatment of root fractures, fragments must be immobilized in close contact and absence of infection. How uh, the root fracture healing by calcified tissue or connective tissue or bone and connective tissue or granulation tissue. Sometimes uh, there is no healing. Uh, if the presence of the inflammatory tissue, we always have to follow up these traumatic injuries. Uh, now I'm going to continue with the dental trauma. Uh, enamel infraction, it's an incomplete fracture of the enamel. Uh, concussion uh, is a touch or tapping. Uh, there is no displacement in the situation and does not have increased mobility. With these two traumatic injuries, we have to follow up the teeth. There is no need to do any treatment. A subluxation, an injury to the tooth, supporting tissues with abnormal loosening, but without displacement of the tooth. A exclusive luxation, displacement of the tooth out of its socket in an incisal or axial direction. Lateral luxation, displacement of the tooth in any lateral direction, usually associated with a fracture or compression of the alveolar socket wall or facial cortical bone. And uh, intrusive luxation is a displacement of a tooth in an apical direction into the alveolar bone. Uh, aversion is a complete displacement of the tooth. Uh, Numerous studies show that this injury is the most serious dental injury and the prognosis is very much dependent on the action at the place of the uh, accident and promptly after the aversion. The time is very important for the treatment of these injuries. Uh, the parental ligament is affected and the fracture of eye bones may occur. Uh, replantation uh, is, in most situations, the treatment of choice, but cannot always be carried out immediately. Uh, as soon as possible, we have to uh, reimplant the alveolus permanent teeth. It's also very, it's also very rare in all among all the dental injuries. Uh, and appropriate emergency management of treatment plans are important. Uh, as I say, replantation is the most situation, is the treatment option, but cannot always be carried out immediately. There are also individual situations when replantation is not indicated uh, in severe caries or periodontal disease, non cooperating patients, uh, severe medical conditions, uh, which mu must be dealt with individually. Uh, but sometimes the plantation may successfully save the tooth, but it is important to realize that 
uh, some of the implanted teeth uh, have lower chance for long term survival. So in the future, it can be expected in the later stage. Uh, this time is very important for evolution. Uh, subluxation, uh, as I mentioned, injury of periodontium, periodontium without displacement and with slight mobility. Uh, it can be pain, mobility, but no displacement. We have to stabilize the tooth in the dental sublux subluxation. There is no need to treatment, but we have to uh, follow up this injury. Uh, Splint is not recommended more than two weeks. It is important also. A lateral luxation, the tooth is displaced laterally. Uh, in general, the tooth is mobile and tender to touch. On per percussion, the metallic sound, we can uh, feel the metallic sound and vital to test should be done. Uh, in the subluxation traumatic injuries, the positioning is recommended as soon as possible with fingers or forceps. And splinting for three to four weeks and may require additional weeks if associated with marginal bone fracture. This is also very important and dangerous traumatic injuries. A uh, splinting stabilization period is different from each other. For subluxation, two weeks. For intrusion and extrusion and lateral luxation, four weeks. And for root fracture, six to uh, eight weeks, we can supplant the teeth. For evolution and reimplantation, re for open effects, two to four weeks. For close effects, one week is recommended for dental traumatology. Uh, for the last update. This is also our case uh, with my the head of the department of my professor, uh, Esra Can. A multidisciplinary approach for the restoration of a root crown fracture with the involvement of crystal attached tissue. Uh, it's a 14-year follow-up uh, case. A 60 a 30-year-old patient was referred to our clinic uh, due to the car accident, uh, and there's a uh, crack in the uh, incisor, uh, maxillary incisor. Following local anesthesia, we removed the coronal segment of the uh, patient, and we had to do periodontal uh, treatment. Uh, they uh, length the uh, root fragment, they length the distance between the fracture line and the alveolar bone uh, up to three millimeter, I think. Then uh, they close the uh, periodontal tissue. Then we attach the tooth with microhybrid composite. Uh, after the 14 years, revealed favorable functional and aesthetic outcome biomimetic characteristics of anterior teeth. Uh, the first treatment option for the rehabilitation of a crown fracture should be reattachment uh, because it is still following the trauma is relatively intact and adapts very well to the remaining tooth. They are conservative and uh, effective alternative treatment for uh, various restorative treatments and it's also cost effective. It has a lot of advantages. Uh, this is the, another case of our uh, long-term provisional uh, aesthetic restoration uh, extracted tooth, crown, and fiber reinforced composite in conjunction with extraoral intracoronal bleaching. This is 22-year-old uh, woman uh, with pain and discoloration complaint at the right maxillary incisor. Uh, the tooth decided to uh, extract it due to the apical resorption, due to the trauma of the uh, 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 teeth, lower teeth, I'm sorry. We extracted the tooth and then uh, following 
internal and radiogra uh, radiographic examination, we place the expected tooth after the bleaching. Uh, we use the plan to use Pontic as a, a bleaching procedure with the extracted tooth. One year evaluation of the case, uh, it reveals the approach is very feasible and durable treatment uh, for the aesthetic quality of the severely discolored and traumatized teeth. Uh, this is the permanent dentition follow up regime uh, I already talked about this situation. Now I want to tell about, uh, talk about uh, guidelines for dental care provision during the COVID-19 pandemic. Now we are in a pandemic situation and it's very uh, difficult for us uh, to examine the patient with trauma. Uh, they categorize the treatment. Uh, they categorize it to five parts for the treatment. When the unconfirmed case referred to our clinic, we can do emergency management of life treatment condition. We can do urgent condition that can be managed with minimally invasive procedures without aerosol generation, or we can do minimally invasive treatment with aerosol generating procedures. But in the COVID confirmed COVID-19 confirmed cases in traumatic injuries, especially in active disease, uh, if unstable patient for, we have only just to emergency management of life threatening condition. If the patient is stable, we can of course do the emergency management of life threatening condition, or we can do urgent condition that can be managed with minimally invasive procedures without aerosol generation. Uh, for the treatment, uh, intraoral, imagine, intraoral uh, imaging or radiograph should be re uh, reduced due to the uh, saliva, uh, saliva, excessive saliva, salivation. Uh, and uh, we have to use uh, providing iodine mouthwash for the at least uh, 40 seconds before the procedure to reduce the viral load in the patient's saliva in the uh, COVID-19 patient and with trauma, before to our clinic trauma. Uh, we all have to disposable and single use instruments uh, whenever possible to reduce the cross infection, of course. Rubber dam, we have to use rubber dam with the patient. Uh, dental treatment should be as minimally as invasive and with not to uh, use aerosol generating procedures. We have to avoid this procedure. We have just have to do emergency management. Uh, what are dental treatment categories? They categorize the emergency a situation uh, for A, emergency, is an unstable maxillofacial fracture that can compromise the patient's airway. Uh, B, urgent condition that can be managed without aerosol generation. A severe pain from fracture vital tooth that can be managed without aerosol generation. Dental trauma with avation, fixation, that can be minimally managed without aerosol generation and stable maxillofacial fracture that requires no intervention. Uh, and C, uh, urgent condition need to need to manage with invasive or aerosol generating procedures. It's a dental trauma with aversion, fixation that needs invasive aerosol generating procedures. These are, of course, the restorative, about restorative treatment. And this is the final of my presentation. Thank you for your kind attention. Dr. Burcu Dikici, thank you for your excellent presentation uh, with a comprehensive review and the successful cases also. 
Uh, as we all know, dental trauma is one of the most challenging cases uh, in dentistry, and uh, the treatment has a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, so it's very important to decide the uh, problem, the diagnose, uh, to decide the treatment plan in the alternative solutions, uh, and to organize all the procedures within the uh, different departments. So uh, thank you very much for your uh, presentation. Uh, but we have some questions also, both okay. from the participants, and I will hope to have uh, a few questions. Uh, the first one is, is electrodontometry uh, vitality test commonly used in daily practice? Yes, of course. We can use uh, electrodiometry for the vitality test. Mm -hmm. If we don't have, we can use uh, cold test. It is also very uh, comfortable for the patient and for the dentist, he can use it. But we have to do vitality test for all the traumatic injuries because uh, we can't have the right uh, answers before the uh, traumatized teeth. And can you please tell which you use firstly? Uh, the we generally of use vitality test, they ask. We generally use cold tests first in our faculty. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and the second question: Why do you prefer natural tooth as a pontic in fiber treatment? Uh, yes, natural uh, tooth. In our case, we used it. In, in general, we use our we use uh, natural tooth because it, it, it has advantages over the composites and porcelain restoration. Uh, first bonding to fiber with natural tooth is uh, better and they uh, give us a better aesthetic for the, due to the appearance of the natural tooth. And they have similar uh, wear resistance. They have similar uh, color change with the adjacent tooth. They, besides this, they are minimally invasive and biomimetic uh, treatment. They are cost effective. So we prefer to use natural tooth for the fibers. Maybe In the general. adhesion, maybe the adhesion uh, would be better also. Yes, of course. Uh, and another question, why do we have different splinting time for trauma? Uh, different splinting time. Uh, actually, the answer hasn't been found regarding the uh, duration of the splinting time. Uh, in general, we should assess the clinical as aspect for the uh, splinting time. For, uh, the effect of the duration of the immobilization uh, is changed for the patients for the uh, diagnosis of the traumatic injuries. The long-term splint uh, leads to enclose or uh, replacement of the restoration, but uh, better outcome of the healing uh, of the case is the short-term use of the splint. But as I mentioned, uh, it is better to use fiber splint uh, according to the clinical case. Thanks, I think. Okay. Uh, do you have any additional questions from the moderators, speakers? Hello again. And thank you, Professor, Hello. for your absolutely fine presentation. It was very useful to make uh, the traumatic lesions is one of the most uh, prevalent conditions that appears in my country, in your country, and everywhere. And a uh, very good point you mentioned to that. I appreciate that. I have um, three questions, if you kindly uh, advise me on what should I do. In COVID-19 condition, as you mentioned, uh, the treatment uh, approach should be as much as conservative and uh, avoiding producing aerosol and droplets and particles. But what we can do with a patient referred to us with the tooth that has been evolved and has received a trauma with subluxation and luxations, 
what is your recommendation? Do we need to do the uh, absolute treatment for this patient? For example, a, a wall sus, if we miss the time, so we miss all the things with that patients. We do, should do something. It does not depend on the pandemic condition. What is your recommendation? Uh, in pandemic situation, we have to do only emergency management for life threatening of condition. But if uh, there's a relaxation, aversion, some emergency cases, we have to do uh, the right treatment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, you, I think you, I think you mentioned to a type of mouse wash, mouse wash, mouse mouse wash. Yes, <laughs> sorry, and that you prescribed to your patients before the treatment. What was that mouse wash? Uh, it it is provadine. Uh, I for accident. A uh, provadine iodine. Oh, for the iodine. Thank you. Thank you for yeah. that. And another thing, the, the, the last slide of yours before the last session, the last slide was a table that presents the type of trauma and the treatment that should be done for in emergency cases and COVID-19 condition. Would you share it later um, with us? Because it the font it was so small, I could not, not read it properly. Can you at least uh, let us know what is the reference that we can write it down and refer to that reference book and read it properly? Would you please of write course, in the sure. chat box and introduce the reference book? Sure, I can send you and uh, Thank you. Or, uh, share with you. Uh, Thank you. I just talk about the restorative part of the emergency cases in uh, right. trauma, trauma. Uh, it has all the uh, departments for uh, COVID-19 procedures. Yeah. yeah, I can share with you, of course. Thank you, I appreciate that, I appreciate that. Best wishes for you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Professor Kayahan, I'm really thankful uh, for to you and all the speakers from Turkey. I really enjoyed it. They, they, uh, they had absolutely great um, speech and presentation. It was very useful to me personally. I, I'm sure that it was useful for all the participants and audience. Thank you. Uh, now we are at the end of the first session and I would also thank you to uh, organizing committee uh, all the speakers, moderators, all the participants. Uh, I hope to see you in the future organization together again. Sure, in the not in the uh, uh, virtual condition, face to face in Tehran and in Turkey. <laughs> I yes, hope so. I hope so. That this happens in the near future and very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now the first speakers uh, would be from Tom's Tehran University. So medical science. The first speaker is uh, Dr. Behnia Far from Restorative Dentistry Department. She's the assistant professor in dental faculty of Restorative Dentistry Department. Um, uh, Dr. Behnia Far, please. The stage is yours. We cannot hear your voice. Would you please turn on your microphone? Okay, it's fine. Would you please share your sc screen? Hello. Hello. Uh, Good time okay, to you and everybody. Yes, we can see your your PowerPoint and slide. Hello to everyone, to all of my colleagues, to the professors and all of the students. Uh, Today, I'm talking about pulp protection using cavity liners and bases. I'm Dr. Behnaz Behniyafar, Assistant Professor at Tehran University of Medical Sciences, International Campus and uh, Restorative Dentistry Department. It's my pleasure to be in your um, session. Uh, I have pre prepared two questions for the students. Uh, which are, uh, I will read on it. I want you to pay attention to my speech and then uh, trying to answer to it. The first question is, which of the following condition is indicated for 
called caffeine treatment. A, vital tube with spontaneous pain, long pain on stimulation, preapical radiograph with apical radiodocency, and micro exposures while carries removal, mechanical micro exposures. And the second question is, what is the most important factor in protecting the pulp? A, type of the restorative material, type of selected liners, C, antibacterial effect of the restorative material or cavity liners, B, remaining dentin thickness, and E, thermal protection of the pulp either by the restorative materials or cavity liners. As we know, the RDT or the remaining dentin thickness is the, is the single and the most important factor in protecting the pulp. In vitro studies reveal that when we have when we have 1.5 millimeters of remaining dentin thickness, it will reduce the effect of toxic substances by 75%. Whenever the thickness increases, these reduction increases. When it's one millimeter thickness, it's 90%. And when we have two millimeter thickness of RDT, there is little or no pulp reaction. This is very, very important for the insulation uh, factor beneath the uh, restorative cav cavity and the pulp. Nowadays, dental restorative materials have been developed to provide pulp protection and prevent the pulp reaction. These are two uh, very important jobs that they do. I want to uh, speak about three materials that are used um, uh, under the restorative materials uh, for protecting the pulp. First of all, the sealers, second liners, and three, the bases. The sealers provide a seamless transition from restoration to the tooth structure. The liners are placed with a minimal thickness, less than 0.5 millimeters, that provide therapeutic benefits like antibacterial action that promotes pulp health. The bases are also used as dentin replacement materials. They, are, they have many actions like thermal insulation, chloride relief, and dental seal, seal through adhesion. As we know, we have the LCTE degree. What is it? It's the change in length by unit length for degree centigrade change in temperature. As you see in this table, uh, we have uh, some of the degrees uh, for materials. Uh, the tube structure has a 9 to 11 degree uh, that uh, the material like glass isomers have um, the degrees near to tube structure. But other dental materials like dental amalgams and composite have um, a most uh, far, they, are, they have more uh, far uh, degree from the tube structure. So, what happens if we have um, if we have changes in the LCTE? What occurs? It occurs the percolation. Percolation is the movement of fluids through porous materials, as in the cyclic ingress and egress of fluids at the respiration margin. When we have cooling, we have the contraction in the tube structure and the dental materials. So we have the ingress of the fluid. And when we have heat, we have the expansion. So the fluid are expressed and there is egress. You can see the gaps between the dental material and the tube over here. You see how uh, the fluids can egress and egress uh, between these two materials. So if we have interfacial gap between the tube and the restoration, it may allow microleakage to occur. What causes? It causes marginal discoloration, secondary caries, and pulp pathology. As you see in these pictures, you can see the discoloration and uh, the fractures that occurred between the uh, material and the tooth structure. The first material, the category of materials are cavity sealers. They have three subgroups. First, the varnishes, second, the bonding agents, and three, 
third degenerative desensitizers. The very, very first cavity sealers were warnishes. They were used on cut tooth surfaces and they were used for decades to fill the gap between amalgam and the tooth until the corrosion from amalgam is formed. Nowadays, some practitioners use it, but it's mostly declined. A thin layer is two to five micrometers. The varnishes reduce the penetration of bacteria and their byproducts into dental tubules, but they don't provide any thermal insulation. The dry solution of varnishes contains natural gum as copal, plus rosin, which is synthetic resin in the soap uh, in organic solvent like acetone, chloroform, and ether. The second subgroups are enamel and dentin bondings. What do the bondings do? The bondings provide retention and they prevent leakage around enamel of the restorations because the monomers polymerize and interlock. The uh, bonding to enamel is a relatively simple process without major technical requirements or difficulty. The etching process increases the surface energy. The bonding to dentin presents much greater challenge. Dentin adhesion relies primarily on the penetration of adhesive monomers into the network of collagen fibers. So the bondings provide retention and they prevent the leakage around the uh, margins of enamel and dentin because they polymerize and interlock into the dentin. Mm -hmm. Amalgam bondings are, the, are another uh, generation of bonding. As we know, amalgam is a hydrophobic material. Dentin is hydrophilic. So they need a wetting agent between them. What is the key wetting primer? It's four meta. It decreases the leakage of fluid when compared to non-coated or varnish coated amalgam cavity walls. Critical studies show that no evidence of reduced post-operative sensitivity has been seen and there is no retention for amalgam restorations. The third subgroup is the sensitizer agents. Luma is the most important one. It has 5% glutar aldate and 35% chemo. It occludes the dent dental tubules by precipitation of plasma proteins and limits the potential for tubular fluid movement and resultant sensitivity. As you see, there's a, there's a pack of Luma and the precipitation of Luma in the dentinal tubules. The second lines are cavity liners. Cavity liners are used to medicate the pulp. They stimulate the reparative dentin formation and their thickness should be under 0.5 millimeters. They can adhere to tooth structure, which in the form of the light cures. They can be antibacterial in promoting pulpal health because they consist of calcium hydroxide. One of the trading marks are Dicol from Sensply Company, which consists of calcium hydroxide. If the excavation extends into or within 0.5 millimeters of the pulp, a calcium hydroxide liner usually is selected to stimulate the reparative dentin. You see over here, one of the self cure ones and one of the light cure ones of the calcium hydroxide. This is a dipole pen for mixing the accelerator and the activator and putting in the purpose origin. The basic pH stimulates reparative dentin formation. We should know that uh, we should make sure that the surface of the tooth is relatively dry. 
we can put the dye curl sparingly on the surface we need. We shouldn't put it over it. And uh, because the compressive strength of the dye curl is very low and it only has the medical action. They are used in the deepest part of the preparation, which there is under 0.5 millimeters of RDT. Calcium hydroxide raises the pH of the oil environment. And recent studies show that the calcium hydroxide stimulates the remineralization through solubilization of the collagenous proteins like TGF beta 1 and GAGs, which are the input, which include the growth factors. As we know, the bacteria grows in an acidic environment. High concentrations of calcium hydroxide with pH over 11 are toxic. So there's a question, what does the calcium hydroxide do after exposing to the purple tissue? First of all, we have the necrosis to a depth of one millimeter or more. Because it has the high pH, it helps to coagulate hemorrhagic exodus of the superficial pulp. The second is neutrophils infiltrate to the necrotic zone. The third is that within five to eight weeks to months, we have light inflammation response. And four, after weeks to months, the necrotic zone under, undergoes dystrophic calcification, which appears to be a stimulus for uh, dentin bridge formation. Traditional calcium hydroxide were chemical autocure uh, setting uh, reaction. What are the problems that we have with, di with dicols? Traditional may continue to dissolve over time due to microleakage or dental fluids present. They lose as much as 10 to 30% of their original volume. The light cure ones have overcome some of these weaknesses, but they don't have the effective um, uh, benefits as chemical auto-cured ones. Other materials are MTA, mineral trioxide aggregates. They have very slow setting, about three hours. Their compressive strength is very low. They have difficult handling because the setting time is three hours. Technique sensitive, uh, they are very technique sensitive in, in definitive frustrations due to slow, slow setting, as I said. They are mostly used as BPC. Most of the actions of the MTA is like calcium hydroxide. It is antibacterial. It has biocompatibility, high pH, radio opacity, releasing bioactive dentin matrix proteins, but they seal very better than the calcium hydroxide. They form a thick and more uniform dental bridge and they have less inflammatory response. Also, they have less necrosis of purple tissues. Another material is biodentin. It has powder and liquid. The powder consists of tricalcium silicate, calcium carbonate, zirconium oxide as a radio pacifier. The liquid contains calcium chloride solution containing modified polycarboxylate instead of water. They have short setting times, 10 to 12 minutes. The efficacy is similar to MTA in BPCs. They form a complete dentinal bridge. There is no inflammatory purple response and the odontoblasts are well arranged and odontoblast like cells were observed observed after six weeks. The third line are cavity bases. The thickest that cavity bases are used are about 0.5 to 1.5 millimeters. They are mostly glass isomers. They have initial 
electrical insulation. They have some thermal protection and may provide fluoride release. We have two types of glass ionomers, the conventionals and the light cube ones. The light cube ones are resin modified glass ionomer or as known RMGI. The characteristics of glass ionomers are fluoride release, anti-cariogenicity, the mechanism is they have initial low pH and uh, they have chemical bond and they can release fluoride. Because they, ad they have adhesion to enamel and dentin, uh, this reduces the microleakage and also the physical explosions. As you see in this picture, there's a glass ionomer, which is based of uh, acid and base reaction of silicate glass powder. They have calcium aluminum silicate and aqueous polyalkanoic acid which is unsaturated carboxylic acid and an ionomer. Resin modified glass ionomer has both acid and base reaction as well as polymerization reaction. It has stronger bond to dentin than glass ionomer due to mechanical interlocking of polymer in dentin. One of the exam examples of uh, RMGI is Fuji lining LC from GC. Okay. We should place an glass a glass ionomer over a dicol or calcium hydroxide. Why should we do this? First of all, because the, the comp compressive strength of dicol is very poor and the glass ionomer will seal the margins around the dicol. As we said, the cavity faces have thermal insulation. It is very important, as I said in the first slide, that we should have two millimeters of dentine or an equivalent thickness of restorative material that should exist to protect the pulp. About one to one and a half millimeters is acceptable. Thermal insulation ha has, has been found to be directly proportional to the thickness of the insulating material and the structure of the material. Other cavity bases that are used are zinc oxide organol and zinc phosphate cements that were a very popular basis in the past, but their use has been declined. The basis with ogenol can inhibit polymerization of resin composite. So we shouldn't use the ogenol formulation underneath the dentin bonding system or composites. We should not remove the sound tube structure to provide space for a base because when the amount of a base material increases, the bulk of the restorative material is decreased and it may lead to fracture, fracture of the restoration, as you see in this picture. Okay. When we want to do the direct and indirect pulp cap procedures, which conditions are favorable for selecting these items? First of all, the tooth must be vital with no history of spontaneous pain. Second, the pain elicited during pulp testing or hot or cold thermal test should not linger after stimulus removal. Third, the preapical radiograph should show no evidence of preapical lesion and when we have mechanical micro exposures. As you see in this picture, the practitioner has removed all of the caries and the, we, can't, we can't see any caries in this cavity. During the cavity, preparation and removing the caries, 
there's a microscope exposure that, that it can be lined with calcium hydroxide and liners, and then uh, the base should be covered on it to make two millimeters thickness of the remaining dental thickness that should be over there. Over here, it's a schematic view. As you see in the first patient, this patient has constant pain. So the tooth must be necrotic and need the RCT. Patients number two and three, they have pain on stimulation, long duration lasting, which is longer than 15 seconds after removal uh, stimulus. They have irreversible pulpitis. They need RCT too. But in patient number four, the pain on stimulation is short, has short duration, which is 10 to 15 seconds upon stimulus removal. This could be reversible pulpitis and could be uh, the tooth could be saved by pulp capping methods. As we know, the indirect pulp cap frappe is preferred over direct pulp cap. We should monitor the pulpal health for several months. It's very important. And also we should seal the cavity very well with respirative materials. It is not recommended to leave carious material if, if the teeth are to be crowned or serve as abutments for fixed partial dentures or re removable partial dentures. In the procedure of indirect pulp cap, the deep carious lesion with no spontaneous pain and vitality tastes are normal. This is an attempt to maintain pulpal vitality by placing a material over a small amount of remaining infected dentin. Removal of this caries may result in a pulpal explosion. What should we do in IPC? We can remove the wet soft infect infected dentin, which is near the DEJ. The DEJ should be very clean. We should not remove caries close to the pulp, which are dry, fibrous, demineralized dentin. And then we can put the RMGI or glass isomer over it to the thickness, which is favorable. And the last, we should restore the tooth with definitive procedures. We should place a well-sealed restoration. Remaining bacteria over the place is isolated, preventing acid formation and arresting the caries process. Should that, so that uh, is very uh, good procedure for uh, making the, saving the tooth vital. Several studies show that restored tooth with partial caries removal have equal success compared with teeth with complete caries removal. Studies show that indirect pulp capping after four to 12 months have lesions that their color has changed from light brown to dark brown. The tissue consistency has changed from soft and wet to hard and dry. Streptococcus mutans and lactobacils have been reduced to few or zero, and X-rays show minor changes or decrease in radiolucence zone. In DPC, there's another process pro procedure. It's an attempt to maintain pulpal vitality by placing the material directly over the exposed pulp. We have small, which is mechanical and non-carious exposure. It's very important in a healthy pulp. The field must be isolated with a dental dam. We should achieve hemostasis, and we should grind the place with normal saline. The calcium hydroxide is the golden standard material that is 
that comes over the place. And then we should place a bit a base like Fuji lining and a well sealed final temporary restorations over the exposed top. After seeing this picture, we have um, tertiary dentin that has been stimulated and the exposure is now over. In this picture, we have caries, which is very near to the purple horn. Care should be taken when we want to uh, have the caries removal. And in this picture, in the small R, we have sensitive caries. After caries removal, which is very near to pulp, we put the dichel or calcium hydroxide over the place, only over the place which, which we know that the pulp is over there, and then fill it with glass isomer over it. And the next stage is restore uh, the tooth very well, which is carefully sealed. Thank you for your attention. And my speech is over. Thank you, Dr. Pehmiafar, for your nice yeah. presentations about the uh, protection of the pulpal tissue during the carriers of mechanical exposure. That uh, is very useful during the uh, treatment procedure in the restorative dentistry. I have some question. I will be thankful if you or Professor Kayhan help me and advise me, what should I do? Um, I wanted to ask one question. I talked about it previously, but one question appeared in my, not one question, three questions appeared in my mind. According to your presentation, uh, one of the material that nowadays, not nowadays, that several years, that is, uh, has been recommended to be used instead of uh, calcium hydroxide paste is uh, mineral tyroxide aggregates or bidentin. For I just now, I my question is about mineral tyroxide aggregates (MTA). Then, as you mentioned, it has a long setting time. If I was to finish the treatment session in one appointment, especially nowadays in COVID pandemic condition, I cannot wait uh, for its complete setting and place a temporary restorative material over it and ask the patients for another appointment to come back and remove the temporary restoration and uh, fill it again. And do you recommend to cover the MTA with a resin modified glass isomer and restore the tooth at the same appointment? Because always the concern is about the competition of water, uh, water between um, MTA and the covering uh, glass isomer that might prevent the complete setting of MTA. Uh, but if I think, and I read in several articles, if I, if I use resin modified glass isomer instead of glass isomer, conventional glass type of um, uh, uh, glass, conventional glass isomer, this competition of water between the MTA and glass isomer will be reduced. And so uh, I can finish the restoration at the same time. Do you, do you recommend it to do it? for covering the exposure size or mechanical or carious exposure and finish the restorative treatment at the same session? Well, most studies reveal that um, uh, when we put the MTA over the place, it's better that we have temporary restorations over it because of mm -hmm. the setting time. But we can use some um, materials that consist of calcium hydroxide and have setting times lower than uh, MTA, uh, which is like biodentin, we can use that, which is 10 to 12 minutes. Okay. And Dr. Yeah, Kayahan, uh, do you have any recommendation about the question I had do, uh, in your practice? Do you cover MTA with glass isomer and uh, do finalize the treatment, the restorative treatment of the tooth at the same appointment? Uh... Thank you. I don't uh, make any procedure directly uh, in the clinic. So uh, I send uh -huh. my patients to restorative uh, departments. Mm -hmm. So 
okay. uh, I have a question uh, to okay. the speaker, if it's possible. <laughs> uh, what's so the, just uh, please let me know. Yeah. Sorry, please let me know uh, in uh, the professor in the restoration department and your faculty what they do. Do you know that? No, I'm not, not sure. The question. No, no, no. Okay, okay, okay. Thank and my you. question is, uh, how do you make the uh, fiber post uh, restoration with the uh, MTA restorated tooth? Do you have fiber fiber have post. fiber post restoration in the vital yes. tubes? No, in oh. MTA restorated tooth. So you, do you mean that a uh, tooth that has received has received the cavity liner MTA? Yeah. No, so no, no. Oh. Uh, in um, endodontically treated teeth with MTA restor uh -huh, uh -huh. restoration. A, a tooth that has received yeah. endodontic treatment. Yeah. Do and, you have uh, for example, any different, any different, excuse me, any different procedure with the uh, fiber post restorations? So if we have used MTA and endodontic uh, tooth that has been endodont received endodontic treatment, probably there was a um, 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 root resorption that we need the um, apical closure and the MTA has been used. So the apical plug, the MTA plug has been placed just in the um, three or five apical portion of the tooth. So the remaining part of the root canal is free just or, or filled with gutta percha. So it depends on the how much tooth structure has remained. Do we need a post or not? If we need a post, mm -hmm. then we need to remove the gutta percha. But the question, the, there should be a question in our mind that whether the gutta percha remain around three to four millimeter at the apical end of part of the root. If it does not, rem if no gutta percha remains in the apical part of the root, so we sh should change our treatment planning. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I'm trying to ask, uh, especially with the lateral uh, wall perfor perforations, not the uh, apical okay, uh, if, closing, but... So if, uh, the wall per if it is a wall perforation, the, the, the endodontist probably provide a pass for the restorative dentistry to place it in the safe procedure if a fiber pulse is absolutely required. But if there is a, um, an exposure in the... Um, um, root wall, we try to avoid touching and invading the root canal as much as possible. Mm -hmm. But if we have to do it, we will ask the endodontist at the same time that the restorative dentists work together to cooperate with each other to provide a pass that without touching the with MTA in the in the cavity wall that has been perforated, the fiber post is used. But as much as I know, if an, any exposure has occurred, we try to avoid invading the canal again. We should, should change the treatment planning. So, you, for example, using only or endocrine, do not in, you do not use a, a post, any type of post. It could be casting post, it could be fiber post. So I, I will try to use the tooth structure in the coronal portion as much as possible and using the adhesive procedure to avoid invading the root canal anymore. I so don't you know. Pre you prefer the changing the indications or maybe uh, you avoid to use uh, that route? Maybe you can- I, if, I, if I can, if there is any, any tooth structure remains in the coronal portion, mm -hmm. I try to use that coronal portion and use the adhesive techniques to avoid invading the root canal anymore. But uh, just in case, if you have to, uh, do you make that procedure on the same time or you wait? Uh, on the same time, uh, MTA application or? Uh... It, it, it depends. It depends, as you know. It depends on the MTA. If the setting time of MTA it takes a long time, so we have to wait until the setting time is finished. But if the MTA has short setting time, for example, if somebody used biodentin, so we can we can we can um, uh, start our procedure sooner. But in my personally, I even for biodentin that the, because I have practice with biodentin, even the manufacturer has become as has claimed that it's set in ten to twelve minutes. It does not set completely. So I prefer to um, to defer the appointment for the next session. Okay, thank you. We make similar procedure. I just want to learn. Do they say, do you do the same procedure? Yes, yes, okay, similar. so we are neighbors, so we have yeah. the same <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
<laughs> thank you, thank you for your question that make it clear for me. So I had some uh, two and uh, another question that finish I finish it. Uh, Dr. Behniafar, uh, you recommend that for cavity sealer the bonding adhesive bonding. It is my question. If you use adhesive bonding, for example, self uh, selfish adhesive, for example, one of the one of the product could be Kelierval S E bond from the Kurari, a product of the Kurari manufacturer. If we apply it instead of varnish to, to, to occlude the tubules to prevent the sensitivity, uh, the bonding uh, practice and works the same as varnish. So it, because it will be solved in the long term and the leakage again occurs, what, do you, what is your recommendation? Do you recommend after application of the adhesive agents, we remove the bonding from the enamel margin very gently with a bear? What is your recommendation? Um, excuse me. Uh, you are asking about restoring with uh, amyl gum or resin composite. No, no, no. You, you about the cavity sealers that we oh. have to tube uh, occlude the tubules uh, that previously was done with varnish and nowadays with different type of bonding agents uh, yes. that can be self selfish adhesive. Um, that could be two bottles, like Clearfill S E bond from the as a product of the query company. Mm, the bonding agent will remain on the enamel margins. So if you, uh, if, uh, if I if we have placed, uh, for example, amalgam restorations in our my country because amalgam has remained still in my country. So the gap will remain between the amalgam and the two cell structure, and the bonding agent has remained between the, this interface. So it will practice the same as varnish. What should I do? Do you recommend to remove the, the bonding agent in the enamel margin with the bear very gently or not? Well, I uh, recommend that you uh, uh, use these um, varnishes. If you are uh, speaking about varnishes, I, I, I didn't understand very well. But if you use the varnishes, it's better to use on the dentin surfaces, I, I think. Do you still we use varnish nowadays? No, no. You're speaking about varnish or, or bonding? Bonding agent. I bonding. talk about ask well, about bonding agent. What we should do no that studies, avoid no the leakage. Revealed that we should um, uh, uh, cover it up. No, we can leave, okay. leave it over there. I don't know what's your suggestion. Suggestion. Uh, if I if I use a bonding agent to seal the cavities to seal yes. to occlude the tubules, at the end after light curing, I remove the bonding agent from the peripheral margins in the enamel margins. If I want to restore the tooth with amalgam restoration after occluding the tubules, with a bear very gently to remove yes, that bonding be agent. Very gentle avoid... because maybe uh, the enamel is bevel. Enamel the... is. Maybe the enamel is, um, uh, it goes through the, uh, the burr. Yes, but, but very gently, yeah. no, no, not yeah. very gently, just yeah. remove. Thank you, I appreciate that. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Professor Kayahan, uh, to let me know what is the treatment procedure and the treatment approach in Turkey, so I learn from you. If you have any other question, please let me know, then I can learn more from you. No, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you for all your kindness. So the next speaker thank you very is, much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Behniafa for presentation. I appreciate that. Best wishes for you. Is there any question from the speakers, uh, from the participant? No question? Okay. We go to the next speaker and the last speaker in this panel, Restorative Prosthodontic Department. Uh, that is uh, uh, that will be presented by Dr. Farid. Uh, Dr. Farid, uh, please turn on uh, your video and microphone. Uh, Dr. Farid is assistant professor of the Department of Prosthodontic, Prosthodontic Dentistry. Would you please uh, turn on your uh, microphone and video? Dr. Farid, do you hear me? Hello? Yes, hello. Uh, sorry. Uh, hello, I cannot see you. Okay, no. now I can see you. Yes, yes, that's right. Thank you. Hello, Dr. Fari. Hello to you and other. Thank you to join us. Okay, yeah, but thank you. And uh, now we have to go for.
share the slides. Would you please share your screen? Yeah, now, uh, is it okay right now? I, I cannot yes. see your, yes, yes, yes. I can, I can see it in the name of God. It's the first slide. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. that's it. Thank you. Uh, and thank you. And thank our colleagues from Yeti Tepe University and uh, lectures were very um, informative for me and uh, I think for the others. And so without any other uh, speak, I uh, start my uh, presentation. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is uh, dental prosthetic emergencies and how new technologies help us to handle them, to manage them. Um, as a very uh, nice uh, doctor, can uh, plot and talk. Uh, I'm sorry if I'm not um, saying correctly. Uh, uh, there is um, something that you can do in your office, but um, sometimes you can do with uh, the new technologies. Um, we were asked to have questions for the uh, audiences. Um, so I have made two questions and I think that you can uh, answer it uh, correctly easily. Uh, the questions are which prosthetic emergency can completely be managed by CAT CAM technology? The first answer is making a new crown. The second, rebasing a complete denture. The third is increasing the retention of a partial denture, removing a fractured implant screw, repairing a chipped veneer layer. And, uh, the second question is in which removable cases can final impressions be taken by intraoral scanners? The first uh, answer is complete denture. The second is a uh, Kennedy class one uh, removable partial dentures. Um, num uh, the third answer is a uh, Kennedy class two re removable partial dentures. And the next is Kennedy class three removable partial dentures. And the last answer is all of the above. And let's uh, from the beginning, we um, uh, make two groups of patients who urgently seek treatment. The patient who, the first group is the patient who doesn't have any prosthetic treatment at the location of interest. And they may need a natural tooth supported prosthesis or implant supported prosthesis. The second group is uh, the patients who already have a prosthesis and they uh, now there is a problem with it. Um, the um, process may be uh, to support it or implant support. Uh, of course, it goes without saying that the second group are more um, sophisticated, complicated than the treatment of you know, the second group. Now, um, uh, by the new technology in restorative dentistry, we mainly mean uh, CAT scan uh, technology. Um, of course, we have other technologies like CBCTs that can help us. What, uh, uh, what I'm going to talk about is CAT CAM. Uh, the first uh, step in uh, using CAT CAM technology is data acquisition or data collecting. It means we have an optic uh, impression of intraoral uh, structures like teeth and adjacent tissues. It could be intraoral scanning or extraoral scanning. Uh, extraoral scannings are uh, done uh, on the, the casts or impression taken from the mouth. The next step is designing uh, our um, intended um, prosthesis and then making it. Making could be in the form of subtractive, that is meaning, uh, or um, additive, that is 3D printing. Um, meaning machines in uh, the CAD CAM technology that we use in dentistry are um, uh, two, uh, two um, different milling machines we have in uh, dentistry. One of them is in office or um, chair side one, the other one is uh, the laboratory milling machines. 
And the chairs I want, we, it can be used for making uh, simple illustrations like inlays, onlays, or crowns, uh, simple crowns, uh, and short span bridges. But the lab scanners can be, uh, lab milling machines can be used for milling uh, metals even. And uh, with uh, right software, they can uh, be used for milling the denture bases. The steps of uh, prosthetic treatment is the same, uh, regardless of what technology you are using. Is it a removable um, prosthesis or fixed prosthesis? Is it implant supported or tooth supported? Everything begins by, uh, by a thorough examination. You should uh, examine internal stru structures. You should um, also uh, pay attention to the external uh, ex structures and then radiographs and um, occlusal uh, checking. Uh, then you uh, should make the diagnosis and then the treatment planning. Uh, how the new technology can help us? Um, if you have an intraoral scanner, or um, uh, even if you send the cast to the uh, lab, um, intraoral scanners, of course, um, better uh, serve this purpose. Um, you can have the data of patient mouth before or after treatment forever. It means that uh, you know uh, we uh, we can't keep the cast of the patient for the long time forever. But these data, because uh, they uh, take a very small space of your uh, computer, you can keep them forever. And if you want to uh, communicate between your patient, if you want to discuss uh, with the patient uh, about the treatment planning, you can use them. Uh, also, you can see the occlusion from the lingual side, and you can talk about the uh, heavy occlusal contacts, where are then premature contacts, or interferences. Then we have intraoral procedures that uh, routinely we uh, do it. Um, and then we have lab procedures. Laboratory procedures actually are very uh, helped by uh, new technologies. It means that um, new technology like CAT CAM has made these procedures faster and easier with less steps. So uh, they, uh, the new technology mostly helps lab procedures rather than internal procedures. Then we have, uh, let's talk about a complete denture. And when uh, new technologies can help us in making a complete denture. Um, Actually, um, new technology um, helps us after border molding and final impression. Why? Because uh, at the time being, no intraoral scanner can do border molding for us. So, uh, for the complete denture, you may uh, you might, uh, must have a border molded tray and um, uh, final cast. Um, you may. Um, uh, a scan, the final cast, or the uh, imp final impression, but you can't bore them more with into our scanner. And then you should have jar recordings. And then uh, you put all of the information to the software. It makes you, uh, um, designs you a complete denture and gives you a milled complete denture for trying after trying and uh, changing if there is anything uh, necessary. You uh, can have the denture base meal. For the dentition, uh, you have two options using ordinary uh, acrylic teeth that is in the market. And uh, you have to glue them by, uh, one by one to the respective area in the and denture base, or you may uh, mill um, all the teeth from a block uh, so that it all are attached, attached to each other and make a mono block, and then uh, glue them all the, um, together to the denture base. So in this option, um, the, uh, the risk of separation or detachment of the uh, denture teeth from the denture base is um, not 
um, common, but um, because um, the teeth are from a monochrome material, it is not as aesthetic as the um, denture teeth that we have um, in the market. For the remover partial denture, we have uh, 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 we also um, should do the preliminary impression, uh, primary survey, treatment planning, preparation of teeth, and then for final impression, if we don't need any border molding, like uh, Kennedy plus three jaws, we can use intraoral scanners. But if uh, we have to do border moldings uh, in uh, distal ex extension cases, uh, we should uh, scan the final impression or the cast. We can't use intraoral scanners. Then um, we can um, put the data in the uh, software, and the software uh, does a final survey for us, relief and blocker, designing the RPD, and the design RPD will be printed by a 3D printing from wax or acrylic resin, and it is cast and, and trying the fr uh, framework, jaw recording, setting the teeth is uh, done as usual. But uh, now uh, for fixed dental processes. And uh, here again, we uh, start with a thorough examination. Now the occlusion is more, much more important for us and because premature contact uh, interferences, um, bruxism, clenching can uh, actually um, uh, fail our treatment. So uh, we should have a very good examination. Then a diagnosis and uh, now for treatment planning, because catacam dentistry uh, is very uh, new, uh, it now is very common in fixed dental processes. You may want to use something like uh, full ceramic um, uh, restorations that are made from uh, by catacam. You should have in mind if you want to use catacam for um, making your processes. Uh, a little bit and the um, um, preparation of tooth is different. And the divergence, uh, the convergence of the walls um, toward each other is more in, um, in uh, when you are preparing for CAT CAM restorations. Also, you shouldn't have any undercuts. You shouldn't have any sharp areas because uh, uh, the burst uh, of the CAT CAM milling machine cannot um, uh, prepare that uh, uh, part. So uh, in this situation, in fixed dental processes, if you want to use CAT CAM technology, uh, you should begin from tooth preparation. Uh, it, it is somehow different from the um, conventional methods. Impression take, uh, taking could be with intraoral scanners. Uh, of course, uh, when uh, you have um, two sides of the jaw, uh, the bridge uh, passes from one side to the other side, um, lab scanning is better than intraoral scanning. Laboratory procedures can be done completely by um, CAT CAM technology in, in most of the cases. Uh, there are different CAT CAM dental materials. Uh, some of them are um, fully biospatic, some of them are lithium disilicates, zirconias, uh, zirconia reinforced lithium silicates, and uh, most of them are monochromatic. Um, there are uh, polychromatic, uh, of course, blocks. But the point is, uh, their uh, aesthetic is not as much as when in the la handmade layerings are done. So if you want the best aesthetic, uh, you, is, um, it is better, it is suggested to use handmade layerings. And the infrastructure, the coping can be from these CAD CAM materials, but it is better to layer them with uh, uh, for the porcelain or for it as in Emacs. Um, and we, uh, we have different kinds of fixed prosthesis. Um, it could be laminates, inlays, onlays, partial coverages, full coverages, and bridges. For some of them, like inlays, 
unlaced and partial coverages, if you are using full ceramic materials, you uh, the only option is uh, CAT CAM making or heat pressing. So um, um, some of the new uh, restorations, ceramic inlay and unlaced cannot be done with ordinary um, uh, mixing um, uh, for this potting porcelain powder with a liquid. It would be very hard and not feasible easily. Um, full coverages, of course, can be done with uh, both um, techniques, but uh, strong materials like uh, zirconia just uh, can be made with uh, cat uh, technologies. Bridges at the back side of the mouth, uh, uh, at the posterior side, is better to made of zirconia, and, and that um, zirconia is uh, just uh, cat cam made. You can't um, do anything um, any, in any other way. Uh, another restoration that um, nowadays are very talked about is endocrine. Um, it, it helps us then, uh, that when we have uh, endodontically treated tooth, not to use the uh, intraconal space for retention of the crown. Um, there are different kind of, um, perhaps a, a different kind of preparation for endocrines. Uh, one of them is like this. Uh, almost all the crown is removed, perhaps because it already had a problem. And um, uh, the retention is much uh, uh, gained from the uh, palpal chamber. Um, I don't know how much uh, it could be successful, but it is something that is, uh, has come in the literature. The second one is uh, when you uh, uh, don't remove all the tooth structure, you uh, retain what it is possible, and uh, but uh, for the opposite side, you may have to uh, prepare all the axial surfaces. We can call them endo overlays. Uh, when uh, you just remove the occlusal surface and you are not going to cover oxygen surfaces, you may have endo-unlays. And these are conservative treatments uh, rather than to uh, make a, a full coverage crown and use the interconal space. Uh, for implant supported processes, as you know, we have two phases, uh, the surgery phase and prosthetic phase. In the surgery phase, um, it is better uh, to determine uh, the uh, position of the implant uh, from the what the, uh, the process is that is going to be there. Uh, it is called that it uh, should be prosthetic driven uh, treatment planning or implant. Uh, when you do this, and you, uh, it means that you uh, actually design the processes that you want, and then make a surgical guide to put the implant at the correct position uh, for that uh, prosthetic uh, um, prosthesis that you have uh, designed. You will going to have. Um, uh, theoretically and sometimes practically, you can uh, use uh, this design for uh, making a, a prosthesis even before surgery, if all the surgery is uh, fully guided uh, and um, no free hand or half guided, fully guided. It means that you know how, uh, where to put the implant, uh, how much is its depth and its angulation and its um, uh, diameter of the implant, diameter of the abutment. So you have the prosthetic, you can make the prosthetic beforehand and then um, at the time of surgery, give it to the um, patient with a very small modifications. Um, now let's talk about the image uh, when a patient that already had a prosthesis comes to us and had a problem. Uh, this uh, uh, kind of uh, emergency is uh, more complicated than the first one. And whatever we do at the first, uh, uh, for the first school and uh, thorough examination, diagnosis and treatment planning is why uh, it's done because we don't want our patient to be one of the second group. Uh, 
um, it is very um, uh, uh, more difficult to know what is the problem for the patient uh, if a person comes to us with a, a problem. What is the problem? What, uh, what has caused the problem? And what is the best kind of management of the problem? So for these um, patients, the best is to prevent to have a problem, but it is inevitable. And uh, so um, we, um, the um, prosthetic emergencies that uh, I could think of were chipping of the near layer, fracture of framework, pain in tooth or implant, tooth or implant fracture, implant screw loosening, implant screw fracture. Uh, the near um, porcelain or um, any other veneering layer, if fractures, um, we should know what has been the problem, why it has fractured. It has been a problem of, um, uh, is it the problem of the lab? Is it our problem? We haven't seen the patient has a, a, a bruxism, a clenching habit or um, it is because the patient has suddenly bited on something hard. So uh, uh, to prevent it from recurring, it is be uh, better um, um, to know what has been the problem. And, uh, but uh, you imagine that uh, in uh, this picture, it has happened, it can be completely uh, um, when it by composite resins, of course, you have to use hydrochloric acid and uh, then silent and uh, adhesives. But in this uh, case, in this picture at the right side, and it is quite different from the other one. It seems somehow uh, um, there is a neglect from us or the lab, not just patients. Why? Because we have reached to the, uh, it seems it is uh, not much enamel, it is uh, somehow seems that it is dented. Now, what we should do, it is difficult to uh, fill this gap with composites and have a nice look because uh, the uh, shape would be quite different. And if these uh, four laminates are made by a lab, and you know the lab, you can ask um, uh, your uh, technician to remake it because they, most of the time, uh, also you may have uh, the data of uh, your preparation, actually the, your uh, optic impression, and they can uh, redo it uh, with the material that they have already used and with the shade that they have, uh, you have chosen and sent to them. Um, but if um, the problem uh, mainly is uh, removing this uh, laminates from the, um, the attached part is not easy. And sometimes you may have cha uh, you ch may ch uh, change your preparation and uh, then you should make another impression or enter uh, scanning. And the excuse other- me, Professor, Excuse me, Professor Farid, we have yeah. 10 minutes. Uh, until the end of this panel, uh, so we should have some some time for the questions. One of the participants have. Would you please summarize your speech for ten minutes? Uh, okay, okay. Um, uh, we should have a framework fracture, fracture, and, and it mostly happens in uh, ceramic materials because um, the connector area that is needed for metals and metal ceramics is not as much as the ceramics. Uh, don't forget, for ceramic materials, you should have um, um, the connector area depends on the type of the ceramic and whether you are using uh, the bridge at the anterior or at the posterior. And the um, posterior side has larger connector, it should have larger connector area. So you should uh, see uh, the uh, suggested, uh, suggestion from the manufacturer of the um, material that you are using and uh, design the connector as uh, they suggest. And zirconia implant framework practice uh, uh, was very common and was suggested for a while, but uh, later the technicians who had used it uh, encountered many uh, multiple times of uh, framework fracture. Now it is not suggested that much and uh, uh, over, um, inferior or in infrastructure of metal is uh, more um, accepted right now. Uh, if you 
have a case under crown, you should uh, you should be careful. You should always uh, look for a case up, uh, under your crown and bridge because um, it is not much clear. Uh, you will see it in the radiographs or uh, when the patient comes with an uh, abscess. So um, now imagine that you have such a problem. You can like this one. You can if um, it is possible like this to do direct uh, restoration. It's uh, do this. But if it is somewhere that you can do direct restoration, you can remove the crown and um, fill this uh, treat this area even if you need uh, to do treatment uh, endodontic therapy. And then you can ask your. Uh, um, lab to uh, give a crown to you after a scanning the impression or intraoral scanning. And then um, um, if you have a cherry side um, uh, milling machine that uh, you can do it by yourself, and a crown, crown or something like this. Uh, what about a fracture of the tooth? Uh, you can now, uh, if uh, the, uh, you have a crown in the mouth of the patient and it is painful, is it uh, the problem is a fracture or not? By um, uh, a simple test, you ask the patient to bite on a soft uh, part uh, at that area. If the patient, when uh, closes, there is no pain, and when opens, there is pain, it is a sign of uh, root fracture. Uh, what we can do uh, after as extracting, it is possible to use, again, new technologies to do um, immediate placement and Im implant placement and immediate uh, provisional restoration delivering to the patient. Of course, not always possible. It depends on how much margin uh, uh, soft tissue, marginal soft tissue is damaged or traumatized, uh, it must uh, be much traumatized. Uh, in, in this case, is a report of uh, making provisional restoration uh, uh, immediately after implant placement. Now, pain around implants. It could be uh, because of mucositis around implant or pre-implantitis. Um, uh, mm, First of all, all these conditions should be uh, actually cured or treated. And then after that, if you uh, still have the uh, implant inside, and some, um, because it, uh, we are playing because um, uh, due to the extra uh, cement and that it uh, has made uh, pre-implantitis, it is better to uh, we, um, make a custom appointment by the CATCAM technology and uh, a, a screw retain uh, processes for the patient. Uh, of course, uh, for that, you should um, have a, a scan body to scan for the implant. The other um, problem is a screw loosening. For the screw loosening, uh, you know that um, um, uh, the processes is uh, attached to the implant, uh, whether it is a um, uh, we have uh, it is a cemented or a screw retain. The connection is by a screw, so we have a screw loosening, and a screw loosening is something that is not good for us um, actually. Uh, if you have a, a screw hole here, you can retighten it. Um, but if you have a cemented crown over that and cemented crown is completely attached to the abutment body and the abutment is loosened and uh, not uh, the, the screw is not tightly at its uh, position and uh, you may have to remove the um, uh, crown sectioning it and removing it and then tightening the uh, screw and the abutment and um, in these cases also you can use uh, a um, uh, actually, uh, new technologies for giving the patient the crown that uh, is uh, could be put on the uh, this implant, and it can be done in a very short period of time. Now, a screw fracture. If you um, see a, a screw fracture, if you can remove the screw, uh, you can uh, put the uh, scan body and uh, again uh, scanning and sending it to the lab, making a, a designing a new uh, processes and uh, giving to the patient. The uh, the, um, uh, the problem is uh, if it is possible to remove the. Uh, fractured uh, screw that uh, uh, it is the most important part. So thank you for your attention on in your service. Thank you, Professor Dear Dr. Farid, for your presentation. And you mentioned the emergency ca emergence cases uh, 
especially about the screw loosening and the other cases like crack, crack to syndrome. I appreciate you present these cases and you informed us about this condition. One of the, um, uh, one of the participant has, uh, has asked about uh, cat cam. Let me um, um, read the question and kindly ask the question of the participant. The question is that uh, about the CAD CAM machines, uh, because uh, this participant has asked that whether CAD CAM machine can be used for measuring the density of the bone or not. And I answer to uh, the guy that no, the CAD CAM machine is for for preparing the restoration or as he mentions for ortho, ortho or uh, surgery, surgical guide. But another question has been uh, presented by this participant. And the question is that, how about 3D CT scan? What parameter can be observed and measured by 3D CT scan? Uh, that whether CAT, CAT CAM machine, the 3D, 3D CT scan can be used uh, uh, by, by using uh, CAT CAM machine or not? Yes, um, um, uh, we uh, have uh, the cities, uh, city cities for uh, measuring the quality and quantity of bone for um, forming the, um, actually our processes, designing our processes, uh, we merge the STL files to the DICOM files and use that bit. STL files are files from our CAD CAM. Uh, the compounds are from CBCT, uh, we merge them and uh, design the processes that I, we want on the CAT CAM so we can have uh, immediate implant, uh, uh, processes uh, to give the, to the patient with this uh, technique. Okay, thank you. There is another question, Dr. Fahid, uh, and the question is that how important is material selection to avoid or minimizing a screw loosening or a screw fracture? Would you please answer this question? Um, it is difficult to say uh, what uh, um, material makes more uh, screw loosening. We know that uh, screw loosening mostly is because of um, actually um, lower number of implants that it should be cantilevers and uh, something like this. Uh, it means it is more mechanical than the uh, uh, material uh, dependent. But we know that uh, acrylic resins um, actually absorb more stress than the um, um, some uh, tougher materials like ceramics. So perhaps with acrylic resin, it is less uh, school loosening. So the answer would be uh, that uh, the reason for the screw loosening would be more the dependent on the designing of the treatment or prosthesis and less dependent on the material. But mm -hmm. if the material, if you want to talk about the material, those type of uh, prosthesis that are acrylic uh, rather than, for example, bridges, this screw loosening may less occur. Is it right? Yeah. yeah. OK, thank you. Is any other questions for the participant? Apparently... Yes, I would like to ask a question. Yes, please, yes. Dr. Kohan. Me again. Well done. Please. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Farid, for your uh, nice presentation. Uh, I would like to learn, you know, the CAT CAM technology offer us uh, 3D printing. Uh, do you uh, prefer or use in your clinical procedures or uh, what do you think about this system? Uh, you know, three, uh, um, we use 3D printing here for making uh, uh, provisional restorations. Sometimes um, they, uh, we use it for uh, night guards, but it is a soft one, not a hard one. So I don't suggest it for the day, uh, nighttime uh, night guards uh, made from um, 3D printers. And um, 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 the materials for 3D printing are in progress. Uh, in the past, they have uh, less stability. Now there are acrylic resins that are 3D printed and as, uh, are good as uh, um, in the term in term of uh, stability. Uh, do not have much uh, changes during time. Now they are getting better. Everything in um, uh, new technology is getting better in, uh, in uh, uh, 
in comparison with the past, and it still is going on. Um, but I think it is um, now uh, we have good um, um, opportunity to use them like uh, for uh, um, provisionals in in office provisionals. It is very helpful. Yes, thank you. Uh, and I have another. I don't know. I, I answered your question or yes, not? Yes. Yes. Yeah, thank right. you. Uh, and uh, I want, I would like to learn your opinion about the accuracy of the intraoral scanners. Uh, do you use it in your cl routine clinical procedures or you still prefer the, sometimes the conventional impressions? Yeah, I think um, our conventional um, way of life was good. Uh, I don't think uh, that uh, we have uh, done something less than what we should do for the, our patients. But in our scanners, the accuracy is, uh, perhaps it is not much uh, that much it should be for uh, when you, uh, you have to scan around the arch. So uh, still we have to use uh, conventional impression making. And um, but it can be very helpful when you are you have a single crown or um, a small a short uh, span bridge. It can be very helpful uh, if you, you have this much uh, these cases for complicated cases and uh, cases that we have uh, we have to um, change the bite and something like that. I think the conventional ways are still better. You say it depends on the crown number or the crown area or the. Uh, yeah. complexity of the case. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And um, uh, the accuracy of the uh, intraoral scanners are getting better as, um, in, um, in comparison to the, uh, the, um, when they were introduced to the uh, um, dentistry. But still, I think for the um, complicated cases, it's better to have lab scanning than yeah, intraoral scanning. Get better. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Kayahan, for um, interesting the subject that you asked on question. Again, I'm thankful to you to join us and accompany us in uh, uh, holding this program. And I hope that uh, we have uh, next uh, sessions, next appointment, next meeting uh, between Tehran University and Medical Science at Yeditepe University as soon as possible. And after that, uh, face to face meeting in Tehran or in Turkey. And, and the, this session, this panel was very useful for me. And I uh, learned many things from your speakers. Thank you for the speakers that you had. And thank you to you to moderate this panel. And if there is any question, please let us know. Otherwise, uh, we should uh, start the next panel that uh, is for the surgical department. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Uh, I hope to see you uh, face to face in Tehran yes, or in exactly. Istanbul. Uh, I don't know any other question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Kayahan. Thank you, Dr. Farid, for presentation. Uh, wish the best and safety for all the participants for all the times. And I hope that the uh, this COVID-19 vanish as soon as possible. Bye bye, everybody. I hope to see you again in near future. Bye bye. Do you have any damage?